Hey guys, hello. Uh, I'll try to be fast because we're late. Hopefully everyone can hear me, see my screen, otherwise manifest something. Um, okay, cool. So I'll start by giving a quick intro to the project. Uh, probably you've heard it if you were there at the last demo, but maybe you forgot. So basically this project, Project Pikachu, the aim of this project is to um, checkpoint the state of the Filecoin blockchain into the Bitcoin blockchain. We want to do this periodically, and the motivation for doing this is that um, proof of work gives security guarantees that uh, blockchains such as Filecoin or blockchains such as proof of stake do not give. So basically, there are uh, two main components in, um, in our protocol uh, that uh, does this checkpointing. The first one is the distributed key generation. So what we want to have is to have all of the Filecoin miners um, create an, aggregate, an aggregate, <laughs> aggregated key. Um, and then basically, this will be the key that they will uh, use to um, um, sign checkpoints onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And so basically, the second step of the, of the algorithm, once this key is created, is the signing. So they do this aggregated key. They use threshold signatures, so only a threshold of them needs to be honest in, uh, in order for the checkpoint to happen. And then they will be like signing, signing spotted these checkpoints. And then the idea is like, um, if we use the data that is inside the checkpoint, we can um, use some storage system, for example, like PFS or Filecoin, in order to retrieve some information about the Filecoin blockchain. So that's kind of like the very, very high level description of uh, the protocol. Um, so next, <laughs> Next, let me tell you uh, what's new for those of you who were at the last demo. If you remember at the last demo, because we are still in a proof of concept slash testing mode, um, we were using Minio uh, instead of using a decentralized uh, storage provider. Uh, again, it was mostly for testing uh, purposes, but the good news is that for this demo, we have removed this and instead we are using uh, a Filecoin K uh, KVS. And when I say Filecoin, we are for, again, for testing, we are not using the actual Filecoin blockchain, we are using Udico, which is the fork of Lotus and basically is kind of like a tested ground for the Filecoin blockchain. In addition to this, in the last demo, we were using one distributed key generation that came from, uh, from the Frost paper. And since then, we have changed our distributed key generation. And um, we've kind of like upgraded it. And now uh, we can tolerate failure. In the previous demo, we had to, like, if there was one malicious participant, the DKG would, would like abort and would not complete. Now, the DKG will complete even with a malicious participant. And basically, I'm going to show you uh, that in today's demo. So let's get to it. I'm going to start by launching everything. So again, we are using Udico. So this is the kind of like um, playground for, for uh, Filecoin. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to add the initial um, miners. So here, what's going to happen is that these miners Basically, again, as in the previous demo, we use like fake power. We don't use like real, real storage. So we are, um, so we are just simulating like miners. And uh, the first step of the protocol that they do is that they do the distributed key generation, and then they have their keys. And now that they have their keys, they can check, out. and they're going to do that every twenty-five blocks. So here we have one. Um, one checkpoint that has just happened. So let's, and we're going to so, soon have another one. So let's wait for this in a few, few seconds. Okay, so now that's another checkpoint. So now what we're going to do is that we are going to add another node. And as I have hint, hinted to you, we are going to add another node that is malicious. So, okay, so first we let this node uh, sync with the rest of the player. And now again, we are gonna do um, as we did before, we're just gonna 
like add the fake power of our um, malicious miner. So now here you see that basically, uh, you see that complaint here. So what this shows is that the miners, they have spotted that Don was malicious. So they have sent each other complaint being like, wait, this guy um, is doing something wrong. We don't want to keep going with him. So we are just gonna finish the protocol on our own. And basically that's what they do. And so here you see that they just like uh, um, continue signing, but however, Dom will not be included in the rest of the checkpoints. So let's, um, let's wait for another checkpoint. Um, here we go. And here we see that Dom didn't, um, didn't do anything because he's not part of the, of the new set of mine. Uh, okay, so now again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and check the checkpoint on the on the Bitcoin testnet network. So we can see we can see what's happening. Okay, so here let me uh, let me copy. So that's basically the transaction idea of the of the checkpoint that Dom has retrieved when he joined the protocol. So I'm gonna go on a Bitcoin testnet explorer. I'm gonna put this CID in. And then basically we see like the checkpoint transaction. And from here, what we can do is we can just follow the chain of transaction and see like every checkpoint that has happened. They are linked like this way. So that's that's pretty cool. We can just like follow the state of the Filecoin chain using uh, Bitcoin. And we see that all the transactions are unconfirmed because we've just like made them right. And here we arrive to the end. And um, now you know what, let me look more closely at the, at the transaction. And here we see that we have some data. So like the checkpoint and this data can be used to retrieve um, information about the Filecoin chain. Um, and here you can see you can see here that uh, unlike last time where we, we are we were using Minio, now we are using a KVS that in that, that is like integrated with Filecoin. So we can see that uh, here Dom when he joined he could get the data from the KVS basically using this. So that's it for me. Uh, feel I. Don't think we have time for questions, but uh, feel free to ask them on Slack on our uh, Consensus Lab channel uh, or in the chat here. I'll, I'll be staying. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. All right, uh, everyone can hear me, right? I guess so you can see my screen. Let's try and go fast. So today, what I want to show you is what we call Eudico Garden. That in the end is just a bunch of scripts. So. We have Eudico, what, what Sarah just showed, where we've been working with it locally, we've been implementing in it hierarchical consensus, but as we are moving into production or we are trying to put hierarchical consensus into production, we needed to try things in a real environment. So that's how Eudico Garden came up, where what we have here is just a bunch of scripts we, that with Terraform, uh, I mean, the requirements are Terraform and AWS CLI, so it's quite limited right now, and a bunch more. You are able to deploy an Eudico network with Filecoin consensus as a rootnet. So the, here in this readme, you'll see all of the scripts that will help you deploy your Eudico network and your Eudico garden in case you're, you want to play with it. Uh, you have like a deploy script that will run a set, like it will spawn a network with a number of Genesis miners in the rootnet. Then you can add new miners. These miners are not uh, like, these are full nodes, no, not miners. If you want to mine, like you can onboard new power. We will add a script soon for that also. And like uh, the reason why we wanted this is that up till now, and, and like actually Sarah has just shown a demo, we were using like uh, dummy consensus algorithms in the root net. And if, as we are moving into, uh, again, like into production and trying to, to deploy this into Filecoin, we wanted to know how uh, like all of our processes and all our, our hierarchical consensus framework was affected by having as low consensus as, as uh, Filecoin in the root net. So we've been running 
a network for actually I, I think this one I started this morning and what I want to show you now is like how we have this this network running with Filecoin expected consensus in the rootnet and how we can have different subnets and we're going to spawn a new subnet with tendering which is also a new thing that we recently that Dennis recently implemented which is support for tendering consensus in subnets so the first thing that I'm going to do is here start let me see if it works. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm. I just started a a, a tender me cluster that I'm gonna use for consensus, and I'm gonna go to. So I have this session attached where, uh, like, if we see, so you'll see here that I already have a bunch of subnets because we've been playing like all day with it, each with different states, each with different flat coins, like uh, SQL game supply in their in their subnet, and what we're gonna do is to add a new subnet um, that we're going to call, for instance, standard mean with a standard mean consensus. This may be a bit, so the standard mean consensus is number two, and the parent, we want to do it from the root, so from the Falcon consensus. As you'll see, like, this is a bit slow because, um, so we, uh, what we're doing here is we are deploying an actor that will represent all of the logic for the subnet and the governing policies for the subnet. And in order to check the, the right ID and like the, that the, the, the actor has been deployed, we wait for at least five epochs of finality. So that's why until like, we don't see five epochs from the Fabian consensus, we like this process won't change. But in the meantime, like I can show you, I can start interacting with one of the subnets that I have over here. So um, I, let me see. I have here, um, so this is a proof of work subnets that I just deployed. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna spawn a subnet in a subnet to see that how fast it is once you use a faster consensus and to, to make a case of what we need, why we need hierarchical consensus once we have arbitrary computation. So um, we're gonna do the same. In this case, we're gonna add a proof of work consensus, but instead of using the root chain as a parent, we're gonna use this T01. One zero. And you'll see that while in the left, we are still waiting, in the right, it should be spawned in no time. So you see that we, we have deployed the actor that is gonna govern this subnet. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna join this subnet uh, so that we can start mining it. Uh, yeah. So this also should be quite fast. Okay, now we have like the tender min, the actor that will govern the tender min from the root net, we have it over here. And we're gonna start like we're gonna do the same. First, join it, and then, uh, and then start mining so that you see a subnet mining some uh, like with tendermint. All right. So here in the right, sorry, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm driving you crazy, but uh, like it. I mean, this is gonna take a lot of time, so that way I can like parallelize the demo. Um, so here in here in the right, like you see that we've created the, the subnet, the new subnet. So now if we list the subnets, but instead of, so here you see the list of subnets from the root, right? If we list the subnets from the, the, the sub subnet from which we, the child subnet from which we created, you see that, oh, well, it's not subnet API. You see that we created this new subnet and that we have some stake here. We could even like send some funds to the subnet and interact with it, even if it's a sub subnet. We could also check like how our checkpoint, you, to show you that this has been running for a while, I can show you that here we are periodically, oh. yeah, so we, I need the, the comment from the left to finish in order to, to show you this, but I, I wanted to show you like the list of checkpoints that we have committed so far for this, for this network. We could also check the, the list of checkpoints for any other network, which probably I'm not syncing with them, but yeah. All right, so now we added the new subnet and we're gonna start mining some for the, we're gonna start mining some tendermint. And 
Uh, so we started using here TM consensus. This is, these are the logs of the, of the, so you'll see here like TM consensus, proof of work consensus, like all of the mining of all the logs from the mining of my subnets. And finally, like before I leave, I want to show you how I sent some file coins to this tender min subnet. Uh, in this case, again, it's it's slow because we're going through Falcon consensus. It would be way faster if we had some other consensus. That's why, like, we do child subnets from the subnets that we have so that we can go faster. And um, so, wait, subnet API. Our subnet was called seven. And here, like, eventually, um, here you'll see the ten Falcons that I just sent from the root chain from to the subnet. And yeah, but in order to leave some room for the rest of the <laughs> of the demos, I'm gonna stop here. If someone is interested in using a code garden or having access to this environment that we have currently running, feel free to drop me a message and I can give you access to one of these nodes. Thank you very much. So hello everybody. Everybody. I think it's my turn now. Thanks for the previous demos. So uh, for those who don't know me yet, I think there's uh, quite some of you. I'm Matej, I'm from Consensus Lab and I'm working on a consensus algorithm that is fast and scalable for being deployed in the subnets that uh, Alfonso was just showing. And so let me share my screen. I hope you see everything. Very good. So I will be talking about Mir BFT, which is a scalable consensus implementation for everyone, not just for the subnets, hopefully. And uh, since this is a project that most of you haven't seen yet, I will first spend a few minutes on introducing it, say what it is, uh, how it works and how it can be used. And then I show a little demo of how it can actually be used for, for an application. So Mir BFT is a framework for implementing distributed protocols that, that has a focus on consensus protocol, but ideally uh, should be able to implement any kind of uh, distributed protocols, or let's say a, vi a wide variety of consensus protocols. It is available at uh, uh, on GitHub, and it is part of the Consensus Lab YT project, uh, the, it, which is the project about scalable consensus. And you can uh, look at more details about the project also in the link. Actually, I will post in the chat um, when I find the chat window. Here is the chat. I will post the link to this presentation so you can look at the presentation and click on the links. Okay, just a little. Uh, just a little heads up, uh, the name MirBFT and the location on GitHub might be updated in the very near future, so stay tuned for that. Don't focus on the naming for now. All right, so how does uh, the implementation of the framework work? Basically, a distributed protocol uh, always has some nodes that interact and they send each other messages and uh, they collaborate to perform some, some task in common. So the basic abstraction is the node, and every machine that is running the protocol instantiates one node like this. And uh, the implementation is as modular as possible. So the node basically just provides an internal mechanism for different modules of the node to communicate with each other, with each other, and uh, for each perform to its task. So there is so in, in there is some application module, there's a module that actually contains the protocol logic, there is a module that takes care of the network communication, like sending actual messages on the network. There is a module that stores uh, the payloads of the requests that are being agreed upon in the consensus protocol. And there are some other modules that uh, are not really that important for this explanation now. And uh, once you instantiate a module, you have three functions that you can run on it. It's that you can call. 
one function is run, which starts all the machinery and the processing that is uh, that is necessary for the for for the node to function. There is the submit request function. So for a for a consensus protocol, when somebody wants to when a client wants to uh, submit a request for ordering for for agreeing upon. Uh, they need to call the submit request function and insert a request in the in the node and the status function is just for debugging purposes we don't need to know too much about it now now the node itself is just basically implementing a slightly fancier event loop that is getting all the events produced by by the modules storing them in a buffer and then processing them and distributing uh, those events to uh, the modules where they should go. Each module then processes whatever events uh, it needs to process, potentially creating more events and so on and so on. So this is just an event. Okay, so this is the very high level architecture of it. Now, uh, how do we use that? So this is an excerpt from the code, how, how uh, mere BSD can be actually used to, to implement a distributed application and to offload as much as possible from uh, from the programmer, such that the programmer can just implement the application or the protocol they need without worrying about too much more. So let me show you a few lines of the code now. So if we want to implement a simple chat application where everybody running a node can will participate in uh, in a, in, a, in a group where they can exchange messages. We need to implement the logic of the chat application. And this is a very simple one. We have a chat application here, and the only state the chat application has is an array of messages that, that is totally ordered from, from each uh, participant. And uh, it needs also the uh, reference to the request store, which is a request or module, so it can actually access the payloads of the messages that, that are being sent around. And so if you want to implement an application, if you want a distributed application with MirBSD, you need to create, you need to create uh, an object that uh, implements an interface that consists of only three functions. Apply, which receives a batch of requests, and uh, whatever the requests are, they just get applied to the state. So in this concrete case, we just cycle through all the requests in the batch. And what we do, we we create a chat message, we print it, uh, we say client so-and-so, send message so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, the message is, is just the request data, and we append it to the list of messages that uh, that the application has. And then in order to be able to restart and catch up with the state, we need to the application needs to be able to create a snapshot, which is simply serializing all the state in an array of bytes, and it needs to be able to restore its state from such an array of bytes, which is not that important for now. All right, uh, so how do we actually do it? As we saw, as we saw here, we have a node that has several modules, and this is exactly how it looks like, uh, what it looks like in the code. So first we create some modules, like the networking module, which the library, the MirBFT library has sub packages that, that actually provide some implementations of, of uh, those modules. So we have a gRPC based network transport module. We have a request store. For now, we ju just use a volatile, volatile request store also provided by uh, the implementation itself. And uh, we need to also tell the node which distributed protocol it actually should be executed so which protocol logic there uh, there is in this case we use the only uh, protocol that is being implemented it's not even yet implemented it's it's quite stubby but uh, uh, it already can be used for for the demo purpose so it's iss it's a total order broadcast protocol it's a consensus protocol and uh, we create some configuration for it and we create a protocol uh, also using a library function because the ISS package is provided also by the library. And then we assemble the node the same way uh, that as was shown on the slide. We create a new node, we give it its own ID, we give it some configuration parameters, and we say which modules it should be using. 
it will be using the net module, the request or the, uh, the protocol module that we just created, and we just tell it what application should be there for processing the agreed upon requests. The crypto module, as you can see, it also needs a crypto module. We only have a dummy crypto module implementation step, but uh, this will change soon, hopefully. And uh, then, then the, we we create some uh, we create some other boilerplate code for actually passing the requests to the uh, to the implementation, and we read we read. Uh, messages from the command line and we submit the requests to the to the node so how does it work i already prepared for a, a deployment of four nodes and uh, basically we just run the chat demo application here which is which is the main file i was just showing it executes the main file that i was just showing one is with one is with id zero one is with id one ID two, ID three. So I let me start all of them. So they all initialize, they connect to each other. And I put, I uh, say, I pressed enter once more on client two. That's why everybody already sees that client two sent an empty message. But uh, so basically, when I type in some message, I'm uh, low message, I, I press enter. What happens is that it uh, creates a request for the for the total or the broadcast system. It submits it to the to the node. The node agrees on receiving that request and all, all of these uh, deliver the request to the chat application which which prints it on the screen now. And uh, given the implementation of the protocol, uh, all these, Will will be in total order. So if I really quickly, uh, if I really quickly typed something in different windows, like I would have to be very fast. Manually is not possible. Then uh, everybody would receive the messages in the same order because they're totally ordered. Now this is a demo application, but uh, the same principle applies to the consensus protocol implemented in the subnet, and that's the the goal for the for the next months to actually make this part of the subnet consent protocol so that's it for the first demo of this thank you very much and uh, i'll leave the floor for the next demo uh let me share my screen cool so um, I basically want to announce a new project which has reached milestone one and is ready for production use. Um, so this is called the Edelweiss Decentralized Protocol Compiler. And I'm going to post the link in a little bit. Um, so this is uh, meant to be um, universal language for specifying protocols. Um, and by this, I mean that it's universal in the sense that it is both um, agnostic to the programming language in which uh, different implementations use the protocols, as well as it is independent of the way the protocol is serialized um, on the wire. So uh, it should be able to support um, any serialization. So that includes all the IPOD technology that we typically use, uh, all the serializations that IPOD supports, but also any other protocols like protocol buffers, flat buffers, legacy protocols like BitTorrent and exotic protocols, whatever. Um, so the big point here is that um, the language is meant to have a, a very simple and flexible type system that can describe any pre-existing and future protocols and is also meant to enable um, writing protocols that are very easily extensible um, uh, with maintaining forward and backward compatibility. So um, very briefly, um, from the front page of the project, you will find all the documentation linked in. Um, the, um, the first piece of information is the roadmap for the project. Um, we have completed milestone one. Um, the 
roadmap uh, captures um, essentially quite a lot of the scope that we plan to cover. The, um, I will talk a little bit more about the first milestone in a second. So the first milestone essentially um, is establishing the, the core type system, um, which is um, an extension over type systems that you typically see in protocol compilers like the IPOD schema compiler or protocol buffers. Um, it, is an, uh, it, it has a few more types because it is meant to be complete in the sense that it can really describe any protocol um, that exists or that you might want to write in the future. Um, so it is able to code generate uh, clients, servers, and coders and decoders for uh, anything you define in the type system. And in particular, it's, um, it supports um, defining services and methods, and it's uh, completely type safe. Um, um, so uh, it can generate services that you define. So services, you can think of it as very much like in protocol buffer compiler. It can generate Go code um, for clients and servers. And the generated code is completely static, so no reflection, and is um, uh, zero allocation um, uh, uh, for the most part. And soon it will be entirely, hopefully, um, zero allocation. So very, very performant code. This is what you, uh, so everything is very modular. Uh, so the networking stacks that are generated, for instance, for services, uh, can be you can plug in different backends. Currently, we have a backend which uses DAC JSON over HTTP uh, because this was what we needed for the first client of this project, which is the um, delegated routing protocol for IPFS and Hydra. Uh, but if you scroll, you know, when, when uh, later on when you have time, if you scroll down the milestones, you will see um, some of the future scope of the project. So. Um, there will be lots of features that um, uh, people find necessary. So transformations between different protocols, um, which is a generalization of the familiar IPOD schema representations, as well as features that are expected uh, to be needed in the Filecoin actors um, space, like um, passing lambdas across network boundaries. So an example application is one blockchain wants to give a, a callback. Um, so a smart contract wants to provide a callback to a client. Um, and um, uh, we aim to be able to sort of describe lambdas uh, over different sort of chains. So uh, different chains might describe lambdas in a different way. And all of this should work quite seamlessly in the language in a uniform way. And uh, you can sort of read about the big picture as you kind of like go through this roadmap document. Um, I will briefly uh, show you the type system that we currently have and just kind of highlight how it's different from um, IPOD schema or protocol compiler schema. So um, um, you will find the uh, standard types that you, you generally expect, so primitives, um, as well as classes like any or, or the nothing type. So composite types like links. Uh, links is, of course, like a special protocol lab type that doesn't exist in other um, type systems. So these are content links. Um, but list map structures. Uh, there are some new additions uh, which are necessary for uh, sort of forward looking features. So um, um, we have a singleton type. Uh, an inductive type and a union type, which are, um, I'm not going to go into details now, you can read in the documentation, but these are very, very powerful types. Uh, some of them is inspired from the modern type systems coming from languages like Julia and Rust. And of course, uh, there are functional types, service types, and methods. So um, the documents that are linked in uh, describe how to use them, what their semantics are, how they're represented on the wire. Um, in the repo, you can find um, uh, a full example of how to define a service. Um, this example is uh, defining like um, 
uh, uh, sort of an early version of the delegated routing protocol. So it's a real example, slightly simplified, so it's uh, digestible. At the moment, the compiler um, doesn't have syntax parsing. Um, so you would have to uh, define your schemas uh, using um, basically by defining the AST of your type definitions in Go. Um, um, soon we're going to have syntax parsing. Um, this, um, uh, this is sort of not essential, it's just a matter of time. And so this is just uh, roughly what it looks like to define a, um, a complete service and um, a little bit of uh, Go code that basically um, tells the compiler to generate uh, Go code for this service. Uh, and you can also find in the repo, um, when you run this code, uh, you, can, you, you, you end up with um, uh, the generated code, you, which you can also view in the repo. It's, uh, it's pretty large, uh, mostly because it's fully static um, and um, quite performant. Um, that's it for me. And I'm going to uh, just send you a link in the chat in case you want to read more and feel free to reach out uh, if you want to use it, have questions. There is a channel in Discord uh, in the IPFS uh, sort of realm called Edelweiss Protocol Compiler. So you can ask questions there or submit issues in the GitHub repo. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is me. I'm going to try and go pretty quickly because I would like to see Martin's demo more than I want to see my demo. Uh, all right. So let's start. Uh, yeah, here's what I did. Uh, I loaded a file over an IPFS gateway, right? Cool. Every, we can do this. Um, so that, that's good. Uh, but what makes this different than other loading files over gateways? Uh, for those of you who are not fluent in multibase and, and uh, multi-formats, uh, this guy over here indicates that we are using a format called bencode, or bencode. Uh, and what we're doing is loading a BitTorrent info hash. So this is the way in which BitTorrent refers to files, uh, and we are able to load it over a gateway. Um, and uh, in order to do this, so we're sort of doing, doing the IPLD thing. IPLD, data model for interoperable protocols. We would like to have a single way of describing how it is that you build different, how you work with different hash link data structures. So you can sort of work with them together. BitTorrent is a hash link data structure. So we should be able to do that. Um, this is what an info hash looks like. Again, we had support for the codec. Here it is interpreted as DAG-JSON. It's got you know, a length, a piece length. They use spaces. God knows why they use spaces. Uh, and then this, which is a set of uh, hashes, a set of SHA-1 hashes for various pieces, which are the little file chunks that make up our Koala friend here. Um, in order to do this, so we have the codec, which is this part, which goes in here. But then we also have to say, hey, this isn't a UNIXFS file. This is a uh, BitTorrent file. Uh, and we did that by passing in a selector along with our parameter here, an IPLD selector, which you can read more about on the IPLD website. Uh, we can use our handy tooling to see what the selector looks like. And here's the selector represented as DAG-JSON. It just says, I would like you to please interpret this thing as a BitTorrent file and then match and grab it for me. So that's what we did. Um, mostly just started by looking at the BitTorrent spec. Here's their encoding format. It's that simple. Here's their data format. It's also pretty simple. Just go and then go implement it in, in some code. The encoder and decoder just use existing B encoding libraries. And the fact that they all kind of turn into JSON maps uh, and then just reflect and turn it into IPLD things. The uh, ADL, which is the logic that lets me say, this is a take this graph and represent it as a file, please, uh, has some boilerplate, but mostly is just 
sit there and follow the algorithm. How many pieces are there? How big are they? Let me take the keys and break them up into pieces, then load them for me. And that's it. Um, all right, a couple things. So what do we have? We have an ADL plugin in GoIPFS that allows us to plug in ADL, like any ADLs. Right now we can only do codecs. Implemented a BN code codec, uh, an ADL for BitTorrent files. Uh, and this is sort of interesting, a patch for the gateway that will allow for rendering any IPLD node that presents as a file. Um, that code. It's basically, I run, run the selector. And if the thing I get out at the end of the day is bytes, you know what? Bytes seems like a file. Let's just render it as a file. Um, maybe slightly controversial to do it the way that was done, but it gets us moving. All right, cool. So how do you how do we merge this thing? How do you make this thing actually usable? Uh, we need another magic CSV file in addition to the ones we already have to track the names of new ADLs uh, like this one, so people know what they are when they want to go implement them. Uh, there is we need selectors to be implemented in gateways. What I did is sort of a uh, a first stab at this, but um, probably two releases from now and go IPFS, we'll have more of this. We need to plumb custom IPLD link systems through everywhere instead of using the default one so we can handle ADLs. And uh, people need to make sure I, I did the thing right. I probably read the BitTorrent spec right, but there's BitTorrent v1 and v2, and I may have missed an edge case. So review is welcome. What do we need to make this like great? Like this seems okay. I can load any BitTorrent file. It means I can also make a BitTorrent client that serves data over both BitSwap and the BitTorrent transfer protocol and basically makes the data available to both networks. And then you can make a little BitTorrent client that makes data pullable over IPFS gateways. Um, but in order to make this really great, we wouldn't like to be able to handle transferring large blocks. This is most BitTorrent clients are the same, you know, respect the same sort of boundaries that we do. But if they send blocks that are too big, we won't we won't be able to handle them. There's a proposal for that. Also, it would be nice if we could use like Wasm to describe the codecs and ADLs so we didn't have to re-implement these in every language. Uh, I, I don't know who's going to go implement this thing in JavaScript, um, but probably won't be me. Uh, so maybe just write it once and we can run it in more places. Uh, there's actually a uh, ben code codec in Wasm that I wrote that still works. There is an ADL that is mostly there, but the Panda, the, the Koala render is a little funny at the moment. So uh, I, I started programming Rust on Sunday. So anyone who knows any Rust, uh, help appreciate it. And thank you. More demos later. Cool. Next up is me. On my screen. There we go. So um, I'm going to present what I've been hacking on for the last couple of weeks. Um, it's called Web Transport. Web Transport is a new protocol developed by the IETF in the W3C. Um, conceptually, it's basically like WebSockets, but over Quick. So it gives you all the nice, uh, all the nice advantages uh, that Quick has: uh, stream multiplexing at the transport layer, so no head of line blocking. It gives you a faster handshake. It gives you better uh, hole punching success rates. It gives you an advanced uh, loss recovery and congestion control and um, all the reasons why we love uh, why we love Quick. But this is not the reason I'm, I'm excited about web transport, actually. And the reason I'm excited about web transport is because it, is, it allows us to do things that WebSockets didn't allow us to do. And the reason for this is that the browser handles um, web transport different from WebSockets. Uh, in WebSockets, the browser always wanted to see um, um, a real TLS certificate. So a TLS certificate that was signed by, um, by a certificate authority, for example, Let's Encrypt. And this also works in web transport, but there's another option. It's called the server certificate hashes. Uh, and basically what it does, it's uh, you, can, you can tell the browser, um, accept a certificate that has a certain hash. And then uh, the browser performs the TLS handshake, looks at the certificate, and if the hash of the certificate matches, it will accept that one. Um, so this is great for, for lib P2P because 
uh, we were never able to to get uh, TLS certificates for all of our uh, for all of our lib P2P nodes, um, but shipping around the hash that's totally something we can do. So I started uh, programming. Um, I have this Web Transport Go library now, um, still a work in progress. Uh, it builds on our our Quick Stack uh, on on Quick Go, um, and it can do uh, basic things now. And I'm going to show you now. Um, so let's um, let's just start up a server. And one thing to keep in mind here, I will now go to um, um, go to example.com, which is mapped to localhost. The reason is um, that Chrome, for some reason, refuses to do quick connections to localhost. So you have to uh, map it internally to some kind of domain name, and then you can establish a quick connection. Um, so we are just going to use the web developer tools and first we'll try to um, establish a connect on oh, this is very small and let me yes okay um, try to establish a web transport connection to example.com slash web transport which is the server here at localhost so what happens um, we get a, a quick protocol error because the the certificate is unknown now we can, um, this is because we, we just used the URL. We didn't pass in the hash uh, anywhere. Um, so now let's use the hash of the certificate here. Um, so now we're telling the browser this, this hash is okay. And then um, pass in the server certificate hashes uh, uh, option, um, tell it that the algorithm is a SHA-256 and the value is uh, what we just entered here. By the way, I just wish that somebody came up with a solution to have a self-describing hash function. Somebody should really do that. So now we have a, uh, we have a web transport connection. Uh, it works. Um, Let's go one step further and actually use that connection. So we can open a stream on this connection and then um, send something. Let's say we send a hello world. And there we go. So this works now. Um, this is pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, if you think that this could be useful for your project, uh, that you would want to use this, please, please get in touch. Happy to go, if you want. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to start from uh, going way back in December when I talked about uh, Optimistic Provide, uh, which is addressing uh, a problem that there is in uh, IPFS that the, the DHT provide process is very slow. So you can see here the delay that it take uh, the uh, the latency that we have that we see when we try to provide something. So simplistically, this means when we someone wants to publish something to the DHT, uh, this takes quite a long time because we need to find the right peers, the peers that are going to be more, most easily uh, findable later on. Uh, so what we also find out, found out through some measurements is that, okay, it takes so long to go and find the appropriate peers and uh, finalize the process. But at the same time, we figured out that actually, if you go back and check uh, after all this time, the 10 or 50 or 100 seconds that it took, um, you know, to find those 20, which is the right number, uh, peers that the provider record should go to, we actually have found those within the first second. Uh, and then the process was just hanging and trying to find even, uh, even closer peers. So, um, yeah, and this is uh, the figure that shows that it's mostly less than 0 0.5 seconds. Uh, but it could go up to a second or uh, a second or two. So we thought, okay, th there must be a way to try and find those peers uh, and finalize the process much faster. Uh, so that's why it's called uh, the 
well, some of the proposed solutions are called optimistic provide. And there were two approaches that were proposed. One is called uh, the estimator based approach, and I'm not going to go into that today. The other one was the double query approach. Um, so what we do there is that uh, instead of going and finding, um, you know, asking around which is the closest peer to the one that I want to, uh, to find according to the CID of the content I want to publish in the network um, and trying to get, get as close as close as possible. Um, let's try to uh, ask two guys at the same time. Uh, and uh, that was actually Petar's idea. And the thinking behind that, behind that was that, you know, when we independently ask two completely relevant peers, um, you know, what is the closer peer that you know of for the CID, when we start getting common answers from peers that are uh, coming back to us, then we'll probably have, you know, uh, the, the com those nodes that are common between both queries are probably uh, the ones that are getting, that are the closest ones because, you know, we are converging to that hash space. So we went on and uh, the update here is that we implemented that and we have some very initial results which I wanted to share with you today. And it seems that unfortunately the results are not very accurate. So it's not necessarily a positive result that I'm um, presenting here today. It's just a progress update and what we plan to do next. So if you go and check what happens when you go and ask peers uh, one by one, like the single query approach, you see that you go um, in this graph, the x-axis is the uh, normalized XOR distance, which very simplistically means what is the distance between where I want to reach and um, what I have actually, uh, which peers I, I have actually found to store the record. Uh, and this obviously is very small, is like 0.01%. So it means that this process is very, very slow, but very efficient at the same time, uh, because it goes as close as possible. Now, going and checking the double query approach, we see that uh, it's not bringing very accurate results. Uh, so that 0.0 something, 0.02 that we've, we're seeing with a single query approach, now it can go up to uh, 10 and 20 and 30%. So it's, um, it, it's still, uh, it's completing faster. And we can see that more than 60% of peers um, are finding indeed, you know, uh, those final peers very quickly, but this does not um, this does not continue for the entire um, process for all of the uh, provide operations that we have tested with. So what does this lead us to think? Uh, it leads us to think that um, we need to perhaps play around with this uh, and have perhaps not two queries, but maybe even do three queries and try to see what is the intersection of answers that we're getting and if you know um, if we can converge faster when three um, separate queries bring us back the correct results. Uh, it means that we need to um, also investigate other approaches such as the estimator approach that, um, yeah, I didn't talk about it today, but I'm going to talk about it in a future uh, session. Um, yeah, and also ideas that you might have. So if you know, uh, if you can think of something that, you know, uh, an estimation approach, which is going to give back results much uh, faster, uh, we're more than happy to uh, receive feedback and more ideas you can find here. Uh, I can share those slides. Uh, uh, there is a proposal, the discussion, uh, and the project page where we post updates and everything. So, yeah, um, that's me. Thank you very much. And, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, Yanis, your screen was frozen the entire time, so we didn't see the graphs. Could you... Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, you should have said. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, people said in the chat, but I guess like nobody wanted to interrupt. Uh, you. Could, could you send? Okay. Um, could you send? Yeah, the links to the graphs, and um, oh, man. and links to the. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, that's fine. And, uh, yeah. and and the implementation links, just so we can look at the methodology. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, where is the place, the best place to send that nowadays? Um, well, I mean, you can put it in the chat, I guess. Per per perhaps. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, IP Stewards Discord also. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'll post it there. I'll post it there. Great. 